Well, good morning, everyone. If you would turn with me in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 5. And the title of our sermon today is Obedience Amidst Pharaoh. And we're going to see exactly what a Christian should expect when they obey the Word of God, when they obey Yahweh God. You know, there's a lot of ideas out there about what scriptural obedience is. And amongst all those ideas, we see certain interpretations where people think that obeying the government's jots and tittles and everything that they decree is somehow obedience to God. No, no, friend, let let me clarify something for you. We're going to ask the Word of God. We are going to search the Word of God, search the Scriptures, as the Lord Jesus Christ said, and we're going to find out exactly what we should be doing amidst Pharaoh, amidst the Caesars, amidst the dictators and the high princes of the world that usher out evil things. Basically, what we're going to see throughout these few scriptures in Exodus 5 is what the Christian, what the follower of Jesus Christ should be doing in the face of adversity. There are plenty of great sermons out there about the blessings of the Lord. There are plenty of spectacular sermons out there that equip us to battle fear. There are sermons out there to help serve us navigate the sea of anxieties that are brought about us daily, just pounding us from the world. But what we don't see so much, what we don't really enjoy soaking up are sermons on the subject of obedience. It's just a topic that is often neglected by us, at least for me. But obedience is the cornerstone of our faith. You know, anytime the Lord Jesus Christ talks about faith, Anytime he's mentioning what it means to be a friend of God, what it means to be a disciple of God, he always adds the contingency in there, if you obey. There's a lot of people that want to hear sermons about believing. True belief yields obedience. If it doesn't yield obedience, it's not true belief. You know, how many of us truthfully turn to the sacred scriptures, or maybe even to the wisdom written by the Puritans or or other great men of God with the intent of understanding obedience, with the intent of studying obedience, with the intent of immersing ourselves in the practice and the study of obedience. How many of us kneel before God, humbly imploring for a heart that yearns to follow His commands with every heartbeat, with every breath, with every stride, to obey Him in every facet possible? I don't think... Many of us truthfully could say that. How many of us sift through sermons online and we skip right over the ones on obedience and rush instead to view the ones that we want, whether it be on the five points of Calvinism, whether it be on eschatology, whether it be on covenant theology versus dispensationalism? How many of us do that? And make no mistake, there is a time and a place for all of those things. But without obedience... We have no reason to believe that anything the Word of God says about salvation is applicable to us if we do not examine ourselves and see that we are, in fact, obeying the Word of God. In all honesty, it's quite a frailty that many of us, including myself, are not immune to. You know, it's just so easy to click on that sermon on limited atonement or that debate between James White and someone else and say, you know, I'll watch the other stuff later. I'll watch that obedience sermon later. And then later turns into the next day and the next week and the next month. And before you know it, you've skipped over it. So I want us to look at obedience in Exodus 5. You know, sometimes we can read through these verses and we can just look at it if it's just something that is merely historical. No, there is in fact a spiritual meaning to everything that the Word of God says The Word of God is purposeful. And so when we read the Word of God, when we go through exegesis, when we're looking to pull things out, it should be more than just the historical context. It should be, where can I find Christ in this? Where can I find the spiritual application that glorifies God in this? So here in Exodus 5, And afterward Moses and Aaron came and said to Pharaoh, Thus says Yahweh, the God of Israel, Let my people go that they may celebrate a feast to me in the wilderness. But Pharaoh said, Who is Yahweh that I should listen to his voice to let Israel go? I do not know Yahweh, and also I will not let Israel go. Then they said, The God of the Hebrews has met with us. Please let us go a three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to Yahweh our God. 
lest he confront us with pestilence or with the sword. But the king of Egypt said to them, Moses and Aaron, why do you draw the people away from their work? Give back to your hard labors. And Pharaoh said, look, the people of the land are now many, and you would have them cease from their hard labors. So on that day, Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters over the people and their foremen, saying, You are no longer to give the people straw to make brick as previously. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. But the quota of bricks which they were making previously you shall set upon them, and you are not to reduce any of it. Because they are lazy, therefore they are crying out, Let us go and sacrifice to our God. Let their slavery be hard on the men, and let them work at it, so that they will have no regard for false words. So the taskmasters of the people and their foremen went out and spoke to the people, saying, Thus says Pharaoh, I am not going to give you any straw. So here we see the dialogue between Moses and Aaron and Pharaoh. First thing they do is that they declare the word of God to Pharaoh, that they be able to be let go. And Pharaoh's response is an unyielding refusal. So then they ask Pharaoh, and then they warn of the consequences of not going. And they are met with rejection and an escalation of the hardship that they are already facing. Their burdens are increased. Their labor intensified. And as we contemplate this historical account, I want us again to just think about what I said earlier about drawing back the curtain of time. I want us to take away the historical aspect of this and glean into the scriptures and find what the spiritual meaning is of this, what the application is going forward. So what spiritual truths can we discern from these few verses here in Exodus? Well, the first truth is found in verse 1. The true servants of God, those who walk faithfully in his footsteps, will proclaim his word, irrespective of the audience, irrespective of the world. In the face of all opposition, they will declare the word of God. No earthly power, no spiritual wickedness can quell, can extinguish their zeal, their fervor, the absolute burning passion that they have to declare the word of God. They do not flinch, they do not falter at the prospect of declaring the full counsel of the Most High. And and then we can see a prompt illustration of this in Acts chapter 5 verse 29 where Peter and the apostles, they were commanded by the Pharisees to cease from preaching of Jesus. But they replied, we must obey God rather than men. See, there's a lot of people out there that say, no, 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 the biblical thing to do is to follow the government. But we see here that this is a prime example where not only just in Exodus, the Old Testament, but we see the New Testament, we have the apostles account saying, no, 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 we are going to obey God. We're not going to obey you. God has given to us what we must do, and we are going to go do it despite what you tell us. And this resolve to share the gospel of Christ, this persists in every true believer. You know, make no mistake, there are no true believers out there that just have this uh, kind of apathetic view of whether or not they want to share the gospel. That is not a true believer. That doesn't mean that you're not going to get anxious. That doesn't mean you're not going to be a little bit frightened. The desire will be there. Every true believer will desire to share the gospel. They will they will have the burning passion to go and do it. And they will be undeterred by worldly opinion. They will be unswayed by the views of friend or family. And there will be an unyielding energy put to doing so, despite the preferences of the powers that be. You know, today we observe a troubling trend amongst those who profess to be followers of Christ. Amidst societal shifts and progressive ideologies... Many of our churches are now starting to fall silent. They're starting to retreat from the public proclamation of God's word. They deem the word of God less valuable, less essential than being united. They resonate with the crowd described in Luke 14. Those who did not count the cost of discipleship. So let's just take a look there at Luke 14 verses 28 through 30 where Jesus is giving this parable of the tower, and he says, For which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Lest when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish it, 
all who observe it begin to ridicule him, saying this man began to build and was not able to finish. So just a glance at the landscape within Christianity today reveals that there are Millions of half-finished towers. There are projects abandoned midway. There are all sorts of towers that are almost done, 99.9% done. But guess what? They did not calculate the cost. But Moses and Aaron did. And that is the example we see here for the Christian to count the cost, to be faithful, to obey God in every facet despite what the powers that be say, despite the possible backlash, and despite even death. These faithful servants of God Yahweh, the Most High God, they confront Pharaoh, a man who wields the power, at least in his mind, the power of life and death, of oppression and liberation, and without hesitation, they pronounce to this man, they say, thus says the Lord. And what they were saying right there is there is a being higher than you, Pharaoh. And to say that, to say that to a Pharaoh, to say that to a Caesar is treason. What then is the response of Pharaoh? Well, Pharaoh embodies, and Pharaoh represents, and Pharaoh is the exact caricature of the carnal mind. The lost man without God. The one that remains dead in their trespasses and sins. The one that is hostile with God. Verse 2 says, But Pharaoh said, Who is Yahweh that I should listen to his voice to let Israel go? I do not know Yahweh, and also I will not let Israel go. So we see in this blunt rebuttal that Pharaoh reveals the stark truth of the, of the spiritual state of his own lost soul, of the lost souls of the people of Egypt, and the lost soul of any and everyone outside of Jesus Christ. He gave the definition of what it means to be outside of Jesus Christ. And that is that you do not know God and that you do not obey God. Who is Yahweh that I should listen to his voice? I don't know Yahweh. And I'm definitely not going to let Israel go. I'm not going to obey him. And what we see with Pharaoh is the connection to the everyday man that is lost. An ignorance of God, a lack of recognition for God, and a defiance against God's commands. And this mirrors the mindset of every man, every woman, every boy, and every girl who remains in their sinful state. They do not know God, and therefore, since they do not know God, they cannot and they do not wish to obey God. But yet we are told in our world today that there are countless individuals who know God. And they profess to have even this quote-unquote personal relationship with God, yet they remain just as rebellious and just as wicked in their hearts as Pharaoh. You know, Pharaoh was a religious man. He was a man full of tradition, religious experience, religious ritual, with much of his affairs on earth being involved in religious activities and, and what would be considered piety in Egypt, yet he was without God. He was disobedient to God. He was an instrument of the enemy of God, Satan. But by modern standards, he might have very well been considered a man who knew God. Well, he's religious. His life is dedicated towards a higher power, having these monuments built. You know, does this and does that. He must know God. No. As the scripture records, Pharaoh did not know Yahweh, and the vast majority of professing Christians in America and across the world do not either. He demonstrated no willingness to heed to his commands, and the same is true of the vast majority of Christians in this country. Scripture testifies that those who do not obey God in truth do not know God. And to not know God is to be outside of God's saving power, to be outside of the blood atonement of Jesus Christ. 2 Thessalonians 1.8 speaks of the judgment of God. It says, executing vengeance on those who do not know God and to those who do not obey 
the gospel of our Lord Jesus. See, there is an inextricable link between knowledge of God and obedience to Him. Equally, ignorance of God translates to disobedience. And when I say that, make no mistake, there are people that have a head knowledge of God. But you cannot know God and be disobedient continually. It is impossible to genuinely know God and persist in disobedience. Just as one cannot truly obey God without knowing God. This might shock our contemporary world, but the Word of God affirms this truth. We look at John 14, 17, and it says, speaking of the Spirit, the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see Him or know Him. You know Him because He abides with you and will be in you. Jesus says in John 15, 14, You are my friends if you do what I command you. And from these we understand that Pharaoh represents the natural man separated from the Lord, unable to obey him because he does not know him, and therefore he is spiritually dead. And in today's world we find many who profess to know God, who claim to be Christians, yet their actions, their disobedience, it testifies against them. It testifies to their lack of true knowledge of God. A knowing friendship. A knowing relationship. And as you reflect on your life, does it exemplify obedience to God? Or at least an earnest pursuit of it? I mean, think about it. Does your life reflect obedience to God? Or is there anything in your life, an urge in anything that wants to obey the God of Scripture? And even further, my friends, does this obedience spring forth from a desire for self-validation or legalism? Or does it stem from a new nature bestowed upon you and the genuine longing to serve and obey God? What What is it? Okay, th- don't be confused. There are plenty of people that say, oh yeah, I want to obey God, but when you ask them why, when you pry deeper, it's because they need some sort of self-validation, that they're trying to work their way into heaven, they're doing all of these things, running here and running there, but it has nothing to do with a new nature being imparted upon them. There is a profound difference between obeying to assuage one's conscience and obeying out of love for the Lord and then hatred for sin. It's the difference between striving to avoid guilt and striving to honor the one who has saved you from sin. Now, reflect upon that, please. The third thing that we can glean from this is, in verse 3, we see the steadfastness of Moses and Aaron and their mission, their confrontation with Pharaoh. They continue to urge Pharaoh, demanding that they be allowed to journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to Yahweh. This persistence mirrors the endurance of God's faithful in fulfilling His will. It is extremely noteworthy that Moses and Aaron didn't simply just write off Pharaoh as a lost cause and say, okay, we tried our best, we're going to go. You know, or just sit back and say, okay, well, we're going to wait for, for God to do something. No, true obedience has feet. It's always moving. It's not sitting on its tail waiting for divine interference. It is actively going out seeking the kingdom of God, seeking to do the will of God. Moses and Aaron, they exhausted all possibilities. They issued a dire warning. Let us go and worship our God, or divine wrath will come. There will be divine wrath, whether it's in the form of a plague, a pestilence, sword. And this aspect of the believer's understanding is absolutely critical. As Paul noted in Romans, we must recognize both the goodness and the severity of God. See, disobedience to God isn't without repercussion. Now, there is a prevailing misconception amongst many Christians today that somehow sin has just lost its sting, its gravity, because we're under this this dispensation of grace, as they would call it. But brothers and sisters, this is deceptive. This is a lie straight from hell. God's commands are to be obeyed, and He is to be worshipped in reverence, or judgment will follow. And as we well know, Pharaoh and his kingdom experienced this wrath firsthand. The Lord spared the Israelites because they were obedient to him. Out of the line of Israel, a Savior would rise, bringing life to his people. Jesus Christ would come from this lineage. He would overcome death and hell, and he would leave behind an empty tomb, and he would ascend to sit at the right hand of the Father where he is now. And meanwhile, what what has happened with Pharaoh? Well, Pharaoh and his armies are still laying at the bottom of the Red Sea somewhere. Their bodies are. But their souls right now 
are consigned to eternal damnation. Here lies the stark contrast. Those who seek to obey amidst Pharaoh, it doesn't matter what is thrown at them. They're going to continue to persist. And then you have a lot of Christians who who are not willing to do anything. But the authentic Christian will be persistent in achieving the will of God. Whether it's to go evangelize, whether you're sitting down and you have the urge to go over there and the Spirit's talking to you, to go and talk to someone about Jesus Christ, whether it's to serve in your church somewhere, whether it's to go and preach, all of these things, the Christian will do the will of God. And that's not to say that you won't be hindered. That's not to say there won't be roadblocks. Pharaoh was a roadblock, but guess what? God removed Pharaoh out of the way. The Christian that is obedient is the Christian that is saved. The the quote-unquote Christian that never obeys, you're not talking to a real Christian. You're talking to a fake Christian, a carnal Christian that has been brought up in a country where this doctrine has been taught that one can be continuously disobedient and yet wear the name Christian, yet show up to church on Sunday and somehow live a life for Satan and themselves and somehow expect to go to heaven. And that is a lie straight out of hell. I want us to continue in verses 4 through 8. But the king of Egypt said to them, Moses and Aaron, why do you draw the people away from their work? Get back to your hard labors. And Pharaoh said, Look, the people of the land are now many, and you would have them cease from their hard labors. So on that day, Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters over the people and their foremen, saying, You are no longer to give the people straw to make brick as previously. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. But the quota of bricks which they were making previously, you shall set upon them, and you are not to reduce any of it, because they are lazy. Therefore they are crying out, Let us go and sacrifice to our God. Our fourth point, Pharaoh was not merely dismissive of Moses and Aaron. There was a scoffing. He was accusing them of tending to reduce productivity just in the name of some laziness, in the name of worship, this lazy worship, I guess Pharaoh was saying. And in his disdain, he sought to punish the Hebrews by denying them the necessary materials for their tasks. He says, you know what, I'm going to take away all of the stuff that we're giving you to complete your task, but I'm going to demand that the same amount of productivity be done. You're still going to have to produce the same amount of bricks that I tell you to produce, but I'm not giving you the supplies to produce them now. you got to do them. And if the punishment was still there if they did not go and produce the same amount. And so how, what, where's the application of this? Well, brothers and sisters, the world will not show you mercy. It will not show you pity. In fact, it it will seek to make your life so unbearable if you are persisting and being faithful in declaring God's word. Why? Because your worship of the Lord, your declaration of the Lord is as jarring to them as nails scratching a chalkboard. And so they want to shut you up. Any preaching about God, any preaching about his word, they stand with those unbelievers in Isaiah 30 verse 11 that say, get out of the way. Turn aside from the path. Cease speaking before us about the Holy One of Israel. We don't want to hear about this God. We don't want to hear about your Jesus. We don't want to hear about what His Word is. We want to continue doing our own thing. So get out of the way. Turn aside from the path and cease speaking before us about the Holy One of Israel. That is the mindset of every natural man. The ridicule and tribulation, they are certainly for the faithful follower. Is that cost too high for you? Perhaps you've not experienced persecution or ridicule for the sake of Christ. And if that is the case, this is the moment, not tomorrow, not the next day. To examine yourself to see whether or not you are in the faith. Because for those who are in Christ Jesus, persecution is not just a possibility. It is a guarantee. 2 Timothy 3.12 informs us, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. All persecuted. It does not say some. It does not say most. But all. It is not a mere possibility. It is an inevitability. So it is incumbent on us to stand Firm. So then what can we extract from these passages? Just everything that we've taken a look at. First, the people of the Lord will proclaim His word, no matter who stands before them. Second, the world, as exemplified by Pharaoh, is devoid of any true knowledge of God. They don't know God. Thus, they are incapable of obeying God. The proclamation of the cross is but foolishness to those on the path of destruction, to those who are perishing. 
The third thing we can see is that the faithful servants of God will persist in their call, even issue warnings of God's imminent judgment. And in doing so, they invite tribulation, they invite ridicule, they invite persecution. I want you to understand this though. Suffering for the cause of Christ is not a punishment. It is a gift granted unto us. And what greater honor is there than to be scorned, than to be mocked, than to be persecuted for obeying the King of Kings, the one in which all will bow and give an account? You know, people, they'll they'll sit there in in these harsh conditions, and they'll sit outside for 48 hours for the newest iPhone, but you try to get them to go to church five minutes down the road. People will do a lot of things for themselves and a lot of things for entertainment but nothing for God. And yet many of these people call themselves Christians. The cost of discipleship has not been duly counted by some of these people. So where do you stand today? Will you follow the example of Moses and Aaron, obeying the Lord regardless of the cost, regardless of the persecution, regardless of the ridicule? Or will you be found echoing the words of Pharaoh? Who is Yahweh? I do not know the Lord nor will I listen to him. We ask the Lord to bless the reading of his words today. Thank you and God bless you.